Afternoon, everyone. Um, good afternoon. Please do keep coming in. There's um, some seats on the side for you. Um, my name's Eleanor. I'd like to welcome you to this week's Big Questions. Thanks so much for coming along. Um, big Questions, if you haven't been before, basically does exactly what it says on the tin. So each week we look at a big question to do with faith um, or life or meaning. And this week um, the question is really big. It's why would God allow suffering? Um, Sharon Dirks is here to come and help us think through that a little bit. She's going to give us a talk. Um, then we're going to have some time to discuss around tables or um, in groups. Um, and then there'll be a question and answer time afterwards. Um, Sharon has a PhD from Cambridge in brain imaging and has held research positions at Oxford in America. Um, and she now works in Oxford as an academic tutor at the Oxford Centre for Christian Apologetics. Um, so do... <laughs> Do text in your questions um, throughout the talk. We'll go through them in the Q&A time, or you can stick a hand up um, when it gets to that. The number that you need for that is on the lectern or on the pillars around the room. So without further ado, Sharon Dex. Thank you, Eleanor. It's a pleasure to be here, and it's great to be back. I, I live in Oxford now, but... My, uh, <clears throat> I saw I'm very fond of, of Cambridge as well. And so here we are to look at this question, why would God allow suffering? And I think it's one of the most difficult questions uh, of all, and potentially one of the biggest barriers to faith. Why is there so much suffering in life? Why are Islamic State committing terrible acts of violence in the world? Why has the Ebola virus killed hundreds of thousands and left many without families? Why is there homelessness, crime, human trafficking, illness, and death? Why are there cyclones, earthquakes, refugee crises? Why is the Calais jungle here? And the questions go on and on. And this is not just an intellectual question, um, and it's not for me, and I'm sure it's not for you. Suffering affects all of us one way or another. I wonder what has been your experience. Maybe it's uh, illness, struggling with an illness. Maybe it's grief. Maybe it's family breakdown. Maybe it's the stress of work and anxiety. For us, uh, our story, my husband uh, Conrad and I met here in Cambridge when we were PhD students and just before I met him, Conrad had been ill for 14 months uh, in bed, literally for 14 months in the middle of his PhD and the doctors today still don't fully understand what is wrong with him. Um, it's uh, something that comes and goes and we're in a full health, normal life at the moment but we live in an age where we're told that science and medicine and technology can answer every question that we have. But actually, what do you do when, when medicine has nothing to say or has very little to say to you? There are no easy answers to this question, and I'm not for one minute claiming that I have all of the answers. But if you have ever asked why, it raises another interesting question. To whom are you addressing the question? You see, if God does not exist, then there is no one to ask. The late Christopher Hitchens and best-selling author of the book God is Not Great, an atheist, was uh, diagnosed in 2011 with terminal cancer of the esophagus, and he was interviewed on CNN. Uh, as, uh, and he was asked whether, despite his atheism, he had been tempted to ask, why me? And he responded like this. He said, you can't avoid the question, however stoic you are. You can only bat it away as a silly one. Millions of people die every day. Everyone's got to go sometime. And this response is incredibly bleak, especially since Christopher Hitchens has now died. And yet, it is very consistent with an atheistic view on life. If God does not exist, there is no point asking why, because there is no one to ask. This is just the way the world is. Accidents happen. DNA makes mistakes. 
Human behaviour is shaped by instincts that have been refined through biological processes over a long period of time, but there's no real reason to be upset with what life deals you. This is just the way the world is, and therefore live as best you can, because it's the only life that you get. But the problem with this is, well, that seems to work in theory. It works in the lecture theatre, but it doesn't seem to work when my relative is fighting for their life in the operating theatre. What do I do with that feeling of anger when I see suffering in the world and when I see loved ones hurt? Where does this come from? The apologist Ravi Zacharias says, when you object to suffering, you are invoking a moral law. In other words, we are outraged and upset by suffering because there is something wrong with the world that we live in. There is more going on than simply instincts refined by biology. The goal of evolution is survival, not necessarily right behavior. And therefore, trying to look at bio biology and expect it to tell us how we should behave is a bit like looking at a clock and expecting it to tell you the temperature. The Christian perspective says that our sense of right and wrong does not come from within. And it doesn't come from our biology. It comes from outside of us. It comes from someone who is bigger than us. Good is defined by who God is. God is a being who doesn't lie. There's no darkness in him. You can trust him with your life. And good is therefore fixed and unchanging regardless of your background, your time point in history, your cultural context. Evil is anything that is contrary to who God is. And just as God is person, so e evil is personified as Satan, a being who has some degree of influence for now. And so an atheist might say, well, the problem of suffering rules out God for me, because if God existed, he would do something about it. But a Christian would say to you, no, it is the very existence of God that helps you make sense of that gut feeling that some things are just wrong. And they're wrong for all of us. Whereas some things are right. You see, it is the very existence of God that enables you to call evil, evil. Now here's another question. If God is so loving, why is there so much suffering? This is a different kind of question. It doesn't ask whether God exists. It asks, what is he like? You see, lots of people believe in some kind of God, but not a lot of people believe that he's actually good. And many of the objections that we have to God are based on the fact that he's morally suspect. And given the suffering in the world, if God exists, then he must either be not all-powerful, some frail old man who would dearly love to help, but sadly can't. Or he must be not good, picking people out like some sort of divine sniper in the sky. He's the malevolent one. Or maybe it's even worse, he has favorites. You have a good life, you have a difficult life. You're not my favorite. Or maybe it's even worse than that, that he's lazy. He could do something to help, but chooses not to, kind of like a delinquent superhero. None of these portray a very attractive God, certainly not one that I would be willing to follow. A loving, all-powerful God must, could, couldn't he have created a better world than the one that we currently have? Well, um, our movies allow us to uh, go in and out of different types of possible worlds. The Hunger Games creates one such world. Maybe some of you have seen um, some of the films. And here we see in, in the earlier uh, films that society is suppressed by its leaders. They are dispersed into districts and the leaders control the food and the resources, and two people from every district are forced to participate in the Hunger Games each year. And in these Hunger Games, they are in a man-made dome. They're oppressors, they control the weather, they can switch it on and off, 
They control whether it's day or night. They can switch that on and off. They control the geography. They can insert a boundary or remove it at will. They can create obstacles that create, make it more likely you will die, or they can send help that make it more likely you will survive. And the only way to survive seems to be to kill others, whether you want to or not. What is the worst thing about this world? I think it's that choice has been removed. And we see ultimately the people rebel and rise up. They want freedom. You see, I think one of the greatest dignities that a person has is freedom to make meaningful choices. And when that freedom is removed, a great sense of injustice arises. And we want, real, we want genuine freedom to be restored. We see this all over the world. We see it down through history. You see, a world in which there is false freedom or no freedom is not a better world than the one that we currently have. You may be asking, how does this help us answer this question? If God is so loving, then why is there so much suffering? God is love. That is right at the heart of who he is. And he has made a world where love is possible. But you and I know that love has to be chosen. You can't force someone's hand. That's not love. You have to be able to choose it. But where there is freedom of choice, there also has to be the option of choosing the, making the wrong choice. There have to be alternatives to the good and the right. Otherwise, you're not free. And somehow God created a world good, but with freedom to choose wrong. And the Bible tells us that the earliest humans chose wrong and rejected God, saying, we're doing it our way, we don't need you, God. And somehow introduced a pattern, a blueprint into the world that I don't understand, but I see it. And so much suffering, not all, but a lot of the suffering that we experience is because of the wrong and foolish choices that people make, the way people treat each other. Perhaps you can remember times when you've caused the suffering of someone else. And maybe you can also remember times when you've been on the receiving end of someone else's folly. And so part of our response to this question has to be, yes, there is something wrong with the world, but the problem is not just out there. The problem is internal. In every human heart, there is something wrong. And yet it is not a personal punishment to us if things come our way, because this is a global thing. Everyone is affected. No one is excluded from this. There is a global brokenness that we are all caught up in. If you suffer, it is not a lightning bolt from God to you. He wants to actually be with you in it. And this brings us to another question. But does God care? Does God care about my suffering? You know, how convenient for God to set up the world a certain way, but he doesn't have to live here. He doesn't have to experience the repercussions of that freedom. Frankly, this doesn't change the horrendous things I see in the world or the things I am dealing with today. What I want to know is, does God even care about what I am going through? And if he does, why does he stay so distant? Why doesn't he come and get his hands dirty in this messed up world? And it's very interesting because that question is addressing a personal God. But did you know that most world religions, in fact all world religions, do not, apart from the Christian faith do not speak of a personal God. If you ask that question in an Eastern context, you are only part of the way on your journey. The aim is to transcend yourself and discard the personal, discard individuality, discard identity. To ask why suffering means you're not there yet. Keep going. 
In Islam, Islam means submission, surrender. And if you ask the question, you, ha you are not yet on the way to simply surrendering yourself to the will of Allah. So where can my personal question to a personal God find its home? It finds its home with the Christian God who became as personal as it is possible to be by stepping into human history as the person of Jesus Christ. Jesus cared about suffering. He mended lives. He looked people in the eye. He got down to their level. He didn't say, sorry, this is just the way the world is. He actually looked at them and he did something about it. He brought hope out of despair. He healed people with sickness. He restored dignity. He brought people from the outside of society back into the center. He even reached into death itself and raised people from the dead. But more than that, he also suffered like us. We wear these crosses around our necks. And we forget sometimes that really right at the heart of the Christian faith is a symbol of suffering, a symbol not of triumph but of execution and death of a man who was flogged and beaten within an inch of his life and nailed to a cross and left to die of asphyxiation. And there's a, a, a prophet called Isaiah in the Old Testament talks about Jesus as being a man who was despised and rejected by men. A man of sorrows and familiar with suffering. I don't know about you, but when I'm going through a difficult time, sometimes the best people to be around are those that have been through something similar. At the heart of the Christian faith is a God who has suffered. And he has suffered like us and he has suffered for us. And he has suffered in ways that have gone far beyond ours. He knows. He's not distant. He knows what it is like to suffer. And he says, actually, I will suffer for you. I will die so that you can live. I will take your pain and suffering to the grave with me and leave it there. You see... At the heart of the Christian faith is, is a cross, is a man who died on a cross. And you might be asking, what difference does a man on a cross 2,000 years ago make to me in 21st century Cambridge? And I don't know if it's helpful to think of situations where, that need mediation, where two people or more cannot agree, cannot resolve something, and you need a third person to come in. And for that third person to be effective, they need to understand the problem, but not be part of the problem. They need to understand it, but not be part of it. And I think it's the same with the problem of evil. To solve it once and for all, we need someone who can relate to the problem of evil and suffering, but not contain any themselves. This was met uniquely in the person of Jesus Christ. Only one person in the whole of history met these criteria. Jesus was the only one who never contributed to the problem of evil. He came to defeat it. The only person to say, Father, I'm doing it your way, your way. Here's the deal. Jesus, who said no evil, thought no evil, did no evil ever. For you and I allowed himself to be consumed by evil. That's what happened on the cross. He was taking evil into himself, off of us and into himself, so that you and I never have to be consumed by evil, either in this life or in the one to come. If you believe this, if you trust in Jesus, Evil does not have to have the last word in your life. I don't know what's happening, but God does. And he knows. He says, follow me, trust me. There is freedom, there is forgiveness, there is restoration, there is comfort in me. And incredibly... 
He did all of this without destroying our freedom. Because we are free to say, yes, please. Or we are free to say, no, thank you. Isn't that amazing? Your dignity, your freedom is still upheld. But there is a way out. There is a way to really live. And it took me to the age of 21 to get this. Some of you are that age, some of you are not. I've never looked back. Finally, final question. If God is real, then why doesn't he get rid of evil once and for all? Why doesn't he just get rid of it? There's so much. Well, the Christian faith says that one day he will. That evil has been defeated on the cross. And one day it will be removed once and for all. That is reality. You know, some of our stories are so broken. Even at your age, some of your journeys are so broken. How do you fix a broken story? Well, atheism says you can't actually fix it. Live as best you can. Fight evil with science and technology and make the most of this life. Eastern religions say there are repeating stories and if you suffer today, it is because of karma from a previous life coming to bear on your life. You can't fix it as such, but you can hope to work to the best of your ability in the, in the hope that the next life will be better than this one. So work hard. The Christian faith says you fix a broken story by embedding it in a much bigger story in which good wins, in which evil and the suffering it causes loses, in which there will be justice. There will be justice. God knows the condition of every heart. He knows how we have lived, what we have thought. And we are told, and this is both comforting and challenging. You see, this is not the end of the story. One day we will all have to answer to God for how we have lived. And on the day that God gets rid of evil once and for all, if it's true that evil resides in every human heart, I want to make sure that I'm right with God when that day comes. And the fact that it hasn't arrived yet is not him making us suffer, it's him withholding it so that as many as possible can come to know him and know the freedom and love that he offers you here today that will continue into eternity. Because on that day, when we see him face to face, he will wipe every tear from your eyes and there will be no more crying or sorrow or pain. I don't know how your life has gone. But God does. And he loves you. And he asks you today again, how do you want to use your freedom? You've got an amazing mind. You've got an amazing future. How do you want to use your freedom? And you can go through this without me or with me. Maybe you've just started thinking about spiritual things. And this has got you thinking, and you'd like to discuss this some more. And I think there are lots of ways that you can stay in touch. And Eleanor will say more about that. But maybe you've been thinking about this, and something has really struck you today. And maybe you actually would like to follow Jesus, even though you don't have all of the answers, but you would like to step out and actually follow him and know his life. And if that's you, I'm just going to pray, and I'd love you to just echo this in your heart. And if you do pray this, 
talk to someone. Talk, come and talk to me. Talk to someone else. So let's pray and then we'll take some questions. Father, thank you for dying for me. Please forgive me for living my way. Please come into my life. Please fill me with your love and your comfort and your hope. Amen. Would anyone, well, I think we're going to have some discussion now in groups, is that right? Yeah, thank you. Tables before we come back for a question and answer time. Please do keep texting in your questions. Today. Hi, sorry to cut across that. Um, we'd like to get on to answering some of your questions. Um, so we'll go into our question and answer time now. Sorry to cut in. Um, we've got a couple of text, texted in questions, but before... Oh, sure, yeah, yeah. Um, so we've got a couple of texted in questions, but first of all, um, does anyone have a question from the floor? If you have a question, just stick your hand up. Someone will come round with a mic. Anyone with a question from the floor, first of all? Yeah. Uh, hi, thanks so much for your talk. Um, yeah, so I was just wondering, you mentioned the very bleak, worldview that Christopher Hitchens had of the world as um, explained by science and atheism and such. Why can't you just accept that um, the world is bleak and that there are no answers and you don't necessarily have to turn to a worldview just because it gives you the answers which you want? Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the question. Um, I, I, that's a great question. Um, and I, I guess I feel like for, for a worldview to be... Uh, satisfying to me. It has to satisfy me both intellectually and emotionally. And I think that in some ways, and I can't see you because of the pillar, but I need to speak into the microphone here. But anyway, um, uh, oh, for x-ray vision. Um, but um, I think that uh, on one level, it solves the problem intellectually, but I just, it doesn't seem to work for me emotionally because I have these gut instinctive reactions to the world and where do they come from then you know and and I think I don't think you know biology alone can explain them I think there are different levels of explanation and we look have to look sort of beyond uh, beyond science to, to to why actually that actually I get really angry at something and there's no reason for that if it's just the way the world is and so what I see is the Christian faith is satisfying intellectually it helps me make sense of the world with my mind but it also helps me make sense of my emotions that the, the, feeling, the feeling that there's something wrong seems to yeah, that, that seems to sit with me. I, I see that even when people try their hardest to be nice to each other, they still can't. You look at any one good thing, and it's open, it's be, it can be beautiful, but open to corruption and misuse as well. And I think the Christian faith helps us make sense of those by saying good is real, it's from God, but evil is also real, and that's, that's from Satan. And those two things are at work in this world. Great. Would anyone like Thank to you. come back on that? Um, or have another question from the floor. Yeah, down here again. I mean, just on that point there, you stated in your talk that you don't understand sometimes and it makes you angry that medicine and science can't solve the health problems we've got because we haven't necessarily researched that far to understand mm. health problems. So how can you disparage the emotions you feel as being something separate from science when it may mm. simply be something yeah. we haven't yet discovered. Oh, yeah. Yeah, no, um, don't misunderstand me there. I'm a scientist. I love science. And I think that it has r 
you know, had a huge impact on our, on our world. Um, and you can also make a case that actually it's within the Christian worldview that the scientific method makes most sense, that God has given us rational minds and they can make sense of a world that is ordered and those both find their origin in a God who is orderer. So um, I, I actually, um, I, I was saying that there are some things in life that science can't yet answer or, or hasn't answered. But I think I, I said that to make the point that we all suffer in different ways. One of the ways that we suffer is that we have something that hasn't been diagnosed properly. Um, and so there's a level of how do you actually treat it. I'm not disparaging the scientific method. I myself am, am a scientist. And I think in terms of our, our emotions, we can explain things on lots of different levels. You know, so... Um, you know, if I, if I, when I was dating my husband, I met him here, you know, the, the kind of feeling of when you're about to, to meet, you kind of get excited. There's all kind of, you know, physiological stuff going on that you can explain scientifically, but there's also another level of explanation that there's a relationship there. And you can't explain that just using the, 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 the methodology you know, just using the mechanisms that are going on there. So there are different levels of explanation. And though I love science, I would say that it's one of a number of different levels of ways that we can look at the world. But if you want to understand it properly, you have to look at many different levels. Why are we here? Why do we exist? What is the purpose of my life? I don't think science can answer all of those questions. To have answers, we need to look elsewhere. Thank you. If we could go for one from the text, a number of similar ones um, summed up in, what about suffering, which isn't directly caused by humans, yes. like illness or natural disasters? How is that down to our bad choices? Thank you. This is a great question. And because of time, I, I limited my talk to moral evil, evil to do with how we behave. Um, but there is also the question of natural evil or physical evil, evil that is related, as, as the text says. So thank you for the question. It's a great question. Let me deal with natural disasters first. This is not as straightforward as it might seem. Um, natural um, events create uh, great beauty. So um, mountain ranges are caused by tectonic plate movement. The Hawaiian Islands are caused by volcanoes. And they're also very life-giving. Tectonic plate movement is used to recycle nutrients from the ocean bed back to the surface. And volcanoes release pressure. And they're very fertile at their f the foot of a volcano. And flooding even brings nutrients to areas. And so it's not straightforward. And we also have to recognize that it's a wonder that life exists at all. If we go to Venus, 80% is covered with volcanoes. Life is untenable. If we go the other way to Jupiter, the eye, the storm, is uh, calls for a redefinition of extreme weather. Um, so although we have cataclysmic events, they seem to be within limits that make life possible. And I guess um, theologians take two approaches. They would say, um, the, the brokenness of humanity, one approach to say the brokenness of humanity uh, has affected our relationship with nature. So things like poverty and corruption vastly increase the death toll. Um, if you, if you look at the number of deaths that you get from an earthquake in, say, Haiti, in the 2010 earthquake, 200,000 people died in that earthquake. Number of deaths from an earthquake in California of a similar strength a few years previously, 57 people died. So although we're not responsible for these events, um, poverty and the, the, wrong, uh, the mistreatment of people and misdistribution of finances definitely increase the death toll. Um, you can also make a case that, that you know, climate change, which is partly due to human activity, is increasing the prevalence of some of these events as well. So there's a, there is still a role um, of people in them. In, um, I mean, I could go on forever, but um, there's also another view which I'd say the brokenness of humanity has affected nature as well. And so some of these events are related to the, the brokenness of our relationship with God. And um, at the death and the resurrection of Jesus, there was an earthquake. As if, you know, could it be that the, this is even reaching into nature itself? It's so vast, it's so wide, the impact that it's reaching into nature. And in terms of um, physical illness, you know, I think, if, uh, again, if you look at uh, a naturalistic position, it would say, well, that, you know, it's the same, this, the mutations that cause cancer are the same mutations that, 
or similar mutations that cause diversity in nature. And so this is simply a, the way the world has been built, that, it, that DNA kind of makes these changes and sometimes it goes well and sometimes it doesn't. So there's nothing actually wrong with kind of... Uh, in a scientific sense, it's simply the way the world is. I think the Christian, Christian faith would say uh, we accept those mechanisms, but we actually might say there's another level of explanation on top of that, which says there's still something wrong, and it feels like it's in our very biology, our very DNA. And I mean this to be a comfort in the sense that it is not a personal punishment to you if you have suffered from a, uh, an illness or a, a relative it's, it's, uh, there's something wrong with the world, but the Christian faith talks of a God who comes alongside us and wants to be with us in it, uh, provides doctors and uh, uh, medicine to help us in it, and that whatever it is we're going through, we don't have to be alone. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Sharon. I'm, I'm afraid that's all okay. we've got time for. Sorry for the long answer. <laughs> no, 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 no. um,